Okay, so I thought I would start off this video with a quick update uh, before I get into the main presentation. Uh, there's been a lot of success lately with synthetic tracking. Uh, in fact, I know of one amateur astronomer who has recently discovered two uh, near-Earth objects using this technique. Uh, the first of which is 2020 M04, uh, discovered on June 21st of this year, followed up by 2020 OG about a month later on July 16. And so again, these are not run-of-the-mill main belt asteroids. These are actual genuine near-Earth objects that he has discovered uh, using the synthetic tracking module of the Tycho software. And so I just find it really exciting that more people are starting to use this technique. And uh, anytime amateur astronomers are able to contribute to the field, and especially whenever they are able to make a uh, discovery, uh, that's just really exciting. And that's kind of the whole purpose behind synthetic tracking is again, uh, to enable uh, the detection of these faint objects, uh, even with modest sized aperture telescopes. And so uh, that kind of leads into the main presentation here is that um, now you've got the, all this data, you want to process it. And the idea, the goal here is to be able to process it and hopefully real time. And by real time, I mean that it shouldn't take any longer uh, to process the data than it did to acquire it. So. Uh, maybe you're limited on hardware resources and that sort of thing and you're, you're therefore uh, you, you don't want to spend hours and hours to process the data. Uh, so I'm going to show you what you can do to speed up the processing time. Okay, so for this first demonstration, I am going to be working with the example data set that comes with the user guide. So if you have downloaded the software and have been working through the user guide, then you're already familiar with this particular data set. Uh, in any case, it comes with 60 exposures and a total acquisition time of 2.2 hours. And I use it as a reference just because it has several asteroids within the data. And so it just makes for a good example. So I'm going to go ahead and launch the synthetic tracker module. And so Again, the whole purpose behind this demonstration is to show how much faster it is to process the data, uh, how much faster it is to run the tracker uh, on this data uh, when we use these more optimized settings. So the first threshold value that you could adjust if you wanted to uh, is the star mask threshold, uh, but you almost always just want to go ahead and choose auto threshold. So you could, if you wanted to, manually adjust the setting here, uh, but again, almost always the auto threshold uh, chooses an optimal value here. Uh, either way, it has very little impact on processing time. So for our purposes, we're going to choose auto threshold and I'm going to click OK. And this brings us to the next threshold. So again, I mentioned two key parameters that actually do have a huge impact on processing time. Uh, the first of which is sensitivity and the other is granularity. So as you can see, uh, the default for sensitivity is 50%, and that is a very good value uh, if your goal is to conduct follow-up of a very faint object uh, that might perhaps be at the edge of detection for your instrument. But if your goal is to uh, conduct a wide search, uh, a search of objects having a wide range of motion, uh, then you might favor uh, losing just a couple percent detection on extremely faint objects in exchange for uh, a, a huge reduction in processing time. So again, that's kind of the whole purpose of this experiment is to see, uh, do we still retain adequate detection in exchange for dramatically speeding up the, the tracker? So I'm going to dial this down to 20%. And then as you can see, uh, granularity has a default value of 67%. And this results in 121,000 motion vectors, again, for this particular data set. Uh, if you had it on a different data set, then it would compute some other uh, number of motion vectors that would apply uh, for that exposure time and total acquisition time and so forth. Uh, but uh, the main takeaway here is that when you reduce the granularity uh, from the default, uh, say down to 20%, uh, you can see a dramatic reduction uh, here to 11,600. So almost a factor of 10 uh, reduction in motion vectors, and that's going to have a huge impact on processing time. 
So I'm going to go ahead and click OK here. And uh, as you can see, uh, it's actually uh, zipping through the data, uh, really uh, processing it quite quickly. And uh, if you recall in the user guide, it, uh, on my particular hardware setup, it took about 20 minutes uh, to process the data uh, using the default settings. So uh, we'll go ahead and give this a moment here to finish up, and then we'll see how long it actually took, and then go from there. Okay, so it has already finished, and so we can go to metadata view, and it indicates that it took 36 seconds uh, to process the data. So that's about 33 times faster uh, to run the tracker on this data set uh, compared with the default settings. And so uh, that's a huge improvement in processing time. And so the next question is, did we still detect the kind of objects that we want to be able to detect? So I just loaded the MPC Orbital database. And if I click on an object here, uh, then you can see in the image viewer, uh, here it is on a single exposure. And so of course we could go through uh, the images here and you can see the movement of it and so forth. So here's another object, uh, here's another one. So clearly it's able to still detect these brighter objects. And then as we go through, you can see it still detected uh, the fainter objects as well. So uh, this is still a very good detection and uh, we're still able, you know, that was, that's a fast mover right there. Uh, this is two arc seconds. So I say that's fast, that's fast relative to uh, the exposure time. So these were two minute exposures and uh, again, 60 of them, about two hour total exposure time. So it's still able to detect these objects even if they um, have a bit fast motion and even if they are faint. Uh, so this is a faint object as well. So the more scientific way to evaluate detection, uh, and that's kind of the next demonstration, is to use the target uh, generator, the test target generator. So here's a module here uh, where you can then inject a target of a known size. And in fact, you can inj inject several of them into the data and then evaluate and see uh, how well it detected those objects for a given uh, th threshold setting. So let's go ahead and try that out. Okay, so the way this works is uh, you navigate to this menu item here, the inject test targets, and this presents the settings for the test target generator uh, module, if you will. And there, there are a few options here to configure, uh, but basically it just comes down to target size target motion and how many targets you want. So the motion type here I've specified as being speed and position angle. Uh, it could also be pixel movement if we wanted to specify uh, how many seconds uh, per pixel uh, as far as that's going to take. So uh, this would be 100 seconds. It's going to move one pixel in the horizontal axis and similarly for here unless we want to change that. But uh, I'm going to use speed position angle and I've specified a given motion here and then the target size uh, for this example is 0.8 uh, signal relative to that of the noise and so that means that it will not be uh, distinguishable on individual frames and then the full width half maximum of 2.5 and this you can specify in either arc seconds or pixels uh, I'm just choosing pixels uh, just to uh, quantify that as being two and a half uh, pixels will be the full width half maximum. And then you can specify how many targets you want. So I'm saying 10 targets in horizontal and 10 in vertical. So you're going to wind up with uh, uh, a 10 by 10 grid essentially. So 100 targets total. And then separation and, and pixels. Uh, so 30 pixels separation between each target in both horizontal and vertical. And then we could specify an offset uh, from the origin. So I specify zero here, meaning it's going to be centered. So if we go ahead and click OK, uh, it's going to inject those targets uh, across each image according to its motion. And then we can open up the output directory here. And uh, what this looks like then is 
uh, if you view the in individual exposures, uh, you won't expect to see the targets again because they have a very faint uh, signal to noise ratio. But if we were to create a custom stack, then we'll, uh, we'll see what happens there. So you can start to see this grid of targets and you can increase the contrast a bit and you can see that a bit better. Uh, I could also use this layer here and then it, it's more obvious uh, that objects that have motion stand out better. So in any case this is uh, an example of a given target size and the question is uh, would we have been able to detect these targets with a certain uh, combination of sensitivity and granularity. So we could run the synthetic tracker and give it 20% sensitivity and 20% granularity and I've already dialed in a lower and upper bound on speed and position angle for this given motion. So if we click OK, uh, you can see what it comes back with. It, uh, 51 uh, tracks were determined and again we had 100 targets so this is saying that uh, we detected uh, about half uh, of these targets and you can actually uh, see that here if we go to evaluate probability of detection uh, it says here we had 51% uh, uh, now it says no confidence uh, and then it has 49% for not found uh, the no confidence is because I have not run the uh, uh, computation of this. So I go ahead and compute confidence of each of these targets and you can see it actually has high confidence uh, on most of them. So uh, now it says here 47% have high confidence, 4% medium, and then the remaining have, have not been found. And so uh, in any case uh, you can go through here and verify that it is actually finding these uh, test targets. So yeah, if we wanted to, we could stack the images again, and you can start to see that uh, detection there. So okay, that's 51% detection. Uh, not terribly great, so maybe we might want to try uh, increasing sensitivity. For example, maybe we'll make that 40%. and. Uh, We'll leave the other variable the same. So as you can see that increased, uh, now we have 92 uh, tracks returned. And let's see what uh, the probability of detection that results in. Uh, so here we have 76 high confidence plus 12 there. So 88 plus 2 that's 90%. So 90% were detected uh, with some level of confidence and then 10% were not found. So a huge, huge difference there, uh, but as you can see, this is very tedious. Uh, there's a lot of there would be a lot of um, you know work involved to iterate through uh, this combination of these two thresholds, uh, especially if you wanted to do it across different target sizes. And so that's the whole purpose now of uh, this module here, uh, evaluate thresholds, is that it gives you now a a way to uh, iterate across uh, different uh, target sizes, so you could iterate on full width depth maximum, uh, SNR, and then you could also iterate on again these two parameters, sensitivity and granularity. So let's take that same size target, and uh, of course you want to make sure that uh, you are back on the images uh, that have not uh, been injected with a target um, manually. So in other words, uh, if you had uh, injected a given size target uh, on these images and it saved them to disk and then you loaded those saved images with the targets in them. Uh, the, the automated module here expects um, uh, the images not to already have uh, a test target in them. Uh, it, it, if, if they do, then it's going to continue to add signal and so forth. Uh, so uh, anyway, you want to start off with a fresh um, data set that has not been injected with targets. Uh, so it's just a good idea to keep that in mind. Anyway, again, this is all very much uh, just a routine that you, you might even only just do this once uh, and then forget about it later. Um, it's just a way to explore uh, what effect these two thresholds have um, for a given target size. So 
uh, again and here's another feature you can also compute the magnitude of the injected targets uh, so that you can actually see the relationship between uh, the SNR um, and how it, for, for your given set of data uh, that corresponds to magnitude so let's try it where we uh, go through different um, sensitivity and granularity so let's go ahead and click start here and it's going to uh, right now it's computing magnitudes and now it's finished that so it only had to compute magnitudes once uh, for this given target size and now it can continue to loop over uh, the different um, sensitivity and granularity settings so I'm going to go ahead and give that a moment now okay so it has now finished uh, processing these iterations uh, as you can see there are 49 uh, cycles to go through and it took 116 seconds total and um, so here's this sort of a uh, matrix if you will again of sensitivity versus granularity and what you can do is hover over a given cell and it will then give you additional information about it so in this example I'm over uh, this particular cell right here and it says uh, sensitivity is 40% granularity is 40% at 99% detection and it took 2047 milliseconds and that is 2.3 times faster than the uh, uh, slowest iteration which would be right here so again as you go diagonally here it's going to get faster but you'll also have generally less detection as well so again at 20 and 20 uh, that's 50 percent detection and then as we go in this direction here we have more and more detection so I've actually performed a more comprehensive uh, analysis here that I saved and so uh, you have all of these different target sizes here so I just iterated over signal noise ratio and so we were at 0.8 is the example we just did and I, I looped over all the different uh, from 0 to 100 uh, for both sensitivity and granularity and so uh, as you can see the, the expectation is that uh, with a really bright target uh, you can just about get away with uh, you know even 15 and 15 uh, on, on both settings and you still have 97 percent detection and uh, conversely as the target gets more more faint uh, then uh, you, you would have to uh, choose a, a higher setting so anyway the whole point of this again is that you can get an idea for uh, you know for a given target size that you wish to capture uh, you, that you wish to detect uh, what kind of setting would be optimal for that uh, while still uh, hopefully being able to reduce processing time and so um, you know I would say this is uh, again something that you can experiment with but uh, uh, being able to reduce processing time by a factor of 10 uh, if you are limited by hardware resources and so forth uh, that can be appealing so um, uh, uh, this setting right here you can color it you can color it by time factor and so as you can see here as you would expect uh, this uh, upper corner here is the most time intensive and then as you go in this direction it is uh, the least time intensive now one last item I wanted to point out uh, before closing is that uh, it's actually fairly quick to run this uh, test target generator uh, on this particular data set uh, the dimensions of the images are 1536 by 1024 uh, but if you had a very large uh, image uh, 4096 by 4096 for example uh, then it's going to take a lot longer uh, to go through each of those iterations and so uh, you might find it helpful to crop the images uh, if you if they're very large um, uh, because uh, you'll still be able to get useful information out of it because what, what you'll find out is again in this example it, it, it does a 10 by 10 uh, grid uh, of targets and then it's going to move a certain motion and um, and so as long as uh, the, the targets stay uh, confined within that cropped region uh, then it, it, it will work just perfectly fine so that's just one tip that if you, if you find it really time excessive to loop through hundreds of different uh,
combinations, then you might consider cropping the images uh, to more reasonable dimension. So anyhow, that's it for now. So thanks for watching and see you next time.